Uh, well, thank you very much for choosing me over Richard Wiseman. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, as mentioned, my name is Samantha Stein, and I founded Camp Quest UK in 2009. And I was director of the organization up until last year when I moved to Holland and uh, let some of my volunteers uh, take over a little bit. Um, I currently act in an advisory capacity and do a little bit of public speaking and, and that sort of thing as the sort of face of the organization. Um, so what is Camp Quest UK? Um, I know some of you might know this, but for, the, for those who don't, it's a residential summer camp program that offers children the chance to explore the bigger questions in life uh, in a supportive environment of equally curious peers. Um, we provide a range of stimulating mental and physical activities, um, encouraging them to marvel at the universe, uh, develop a critical eye, and most importantly, a love of learning. Uh, we run workshops in P4C, which I'll explain a little later. It's philosophy for children, and uh, science, critical thinking, all that kind of thing, as well as the outdoor activities. Um, so, like I said, I'll go into a bit more detail about the actual program, um, but for now, I'm just going to give you an idea of yeah, oh, I can see it there. What you'll be listening to over the next uh, 40 or so minutes. Um, so I'll give you a brief history of Camp Quest and Camp Quest UK. Um, I'll explain what we're actually aiming for and, and why we're doing this. Uh, I'll tell you what we actually do in the camps. And if I haven't put you off completely, I'll let you know how you can help. So, oops. Camp Quest held its first ever camp in 1996 in Kentucky, USA and it was the brainchild of Edwin and Helen Kagan who wanted to create a secular alternative to the Boy Scouts of America. And at that time, they had a policy of not accepting openly gay or atheist members or leaders. And I'm not sure whether that's changed recently. I know that they came under fire a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, but that this is quite separate to the Girl Scouts in America who are actually quite a liberal organization. So for, the, for children, maybe they weren't openly gay at the time, but definitely for the atheist children, um, there wasn't really many places for them to go to have this traditional summer camp experience. Um, so sadly, the founder, Edwin, passed away at the end of March this year, but we will remain eternally grateful for all his help and his hard work with Camp Quest and the wider atheist community. He was the national legal director for American Atheists as well. Um, they really couldn't have picked a more challenging location to start an atheist summer camp or a summer camp based on secular values. As you probably know, Kentucky is one of the more conservative and religious states there is, and there's quite high levels of mistrust towards atheists in general. Many of the campers at these early camps reported being quite ostracized from their peers at school, bullied, harassed, um, and excluded in general. Um, you know, you'd get parents who say, no, she can't come and sleep over because she's an atheist. So some of these kids were really like, quite traumatized and isolated from their peers. Um, and the, the, in fact, the first few camps were quite fraught with difficulty um, because um, many of the, the summer camps that were available in Kentucky to hire out uh, wouldn't actually accept a booking from an explicitly secular camp at the time because they were owned by churches or the person who owned them just didn't like atheists. Um, so it took them a couple of years actually to find a good location, but eventually they did one and um, they've been going ever since. So I'll fast forward to 2007, because I did say it would be a brief history. Um, over the next 10 or so years, um, Camp Quest had this, by this point grown to six camps across North America, operating independently under the banner of Camp Quest Inc., which now serves as an umbrella group for the different affiliates. Um, so Camp Quest UK is actually independent of this, but we try and hold the same broad values and make sure that we're, not too, uh, we're, we're aligned with one another. Um, so this was the year in which I first volunteered at Camp Quest in Michigan, which is there, in case you didn't know. Um, and I was an enthusiastic 21-year-old who had just read The God Delusion for the first time, so I knew everything. Um, so my experience at Camp Quest in Michigan was actually an extremely profound one. Um, I saw the way in which you could really change a group of children over the course of a week, um, and, and it really made an impact on the young people. And I, I saw how they responded to this spirit of open inquiry and the opportunity to discuss issues deeply that maybe their friends at school didn't really care about. Um, so 
it was such a close and caring community that by the end of the week, my mind was just full of different ideas, um, different ideas for sessions, topics to talk about, that I knew that I had to, had to keep going, um, although my money was probably running out by that point. So um, at the end of the week, the staff members said to me, why don't you set one up in the UK? And I thought, mm, I don't really know much about summer camps. Um, and obviously, I was pretty young at the time, but eventually I thought, well, why not? You know, I like setting things up, and this is obviously something that's incredibly valuable. I'm sure we could do something in the UK. Um, so this is me at the 2007 camp. This is actually what happens to your hair at camp. I need to talk to the Beauty by the Geeks women, if they're around, um, <laughs> for some sort of science-based hair solution, um, because some of the water pressure is terrible. Um, so, as I said, I was young at the time, I didn't have very much experience with summer camps, and even I was only just beginning to get into the idea of the intellectual arguments behind atheism. I'd been an atheist my whole life, but I'd thought about it more in a uh, sort of reactive way to religion rather than an explicitly sort of intellectual approach to atheism and, and philosophy. Um, so, with, with the encouragement from, from the US staff, I, I put together a team, I, try, I recruited some volunteers to help me, and uh, this made the job a lot easier. Uh, so, really, don't ever underestimate the power of surrounding yourself by people who actually know what they're doing, um, because it helped me out, didn't it? <laughs> um, so, these were, our, these were our volunteers for last year, the 2013 camp. You can see uh, me on the end. Uh, that's actually a slope, I'm not that short. Um, and in the middle is Diana, and standing next to her on her right, well, on her left, on your right, is Paul, who's, uh, do you want to just wave to everyone? Uh, if you have any questions, you can always uh, ask him at the end as well, if you like. Um, and, and Kirill, and, and the four of us are kind of, uh, we've, we've been the core team, and we've, we've been there for several years, and we have other volunteers. Some volunteers come once, and then they can't make it again, but we have a very good return rate on these. Um, so, just backtracking to our first year, 2009, um, we started off with 24 children and eight staff in a campsite in Somerset. And interestingly, three of the children in this picture are still attending Camp Quest every year. Um, they've been to every single one, so that, um, I think, shows how much they, how much they like it. Um, and there are also two people in the room who I've just embarrassed because this is a five-year-old picture of them, but I'm not going to embarrass them by uh, looking at them or <laughs> uh, mentioning their names. Um, this year, we, that year, we had quite a huge and overwhelming amount of media coverage, um, which I didn't really understand at the time because, as you can see, there were 24 children. It's not, it didn't seem like we were really changing the world. Um, but... Uh, yeah, this is just an example of some of the headlines that we had. Uh, that's not true. We didn't sing Imagine, I don't think. Imagine, they really, I mean, come on, how naff is that? Like, no, no, we didn't do that. Um, and uh, this isn't, oh, no, the Daily Mail ran two articles, and one of them was something like, Britain's first camp for atheists, should we be worried? Um, and, and it called me sort of like, uh, what was it? Oh, yes, she sounds like a BBC youth presenter, which apparently is an insult. Um, this, this small, mousy-haired girl is, has got an axe to grind with religion. And, you know, it was funny because we didn't actually invite the Daily Mail to uh, come to our camp, so I don't know where they got this information from. Um, this is another one that I really like. Christian Institu Institute concerned over new atheist summer camp. Um, what's the quote? Deputy Director Simon Calvert told The Telegraph, atheists are desperate in their attempts to stamp out faith. The 24 places on Camp Quest UK, you know, <laughs> it's really desperate, you know, um, have already been booked up. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, very, it was a very strange experience having something that felt like we were just doing a nice thing for some children, being blown into this desire to take over the world. And then I think the next one's the Times Online, yeah. Dawkins sets up kids' camp to groom atheists. And this was on the front page of the Sunday Times. I mean, slow news day. Uh, yeah, Dawkins didn't actually set it up. He gave us a very modest donation. Well, we were very grateful. That sounded really rude, actually, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he, gave us a, he gave us a donation to help us in our first year. Um, and, and that was pretty the extent of his involvement. He supports what we do, but he didn't set it up. Um, and this word, groom atheist, is just horrible. So yeah, I haven't read the Times since then. Uh, but we were in the private eye. Uh, I'm sorry, Cuthbert, but because you came last in the running race, you must die. Um, 
But yeah, we're not a Darwinian summer camp, let's put it this way. <laughs> But uh, we, did, we did get a lot of positive press coverage. Um, the, probably the papers you would expect to cover us in a positive way, The Independent, The Guardian. Um, and we were, I mean, it was, it was completely ridiculous. We were on CNN and BBC Breakfast, and yeah, it was, it was completely insane. Um, luckily, they realized by that year that it was actually a really boring story, so they didn't bother us again. Um, so, luckily, one of the good things about this media coverage was that we got a lot of inquiries from parents who said, oh, I read this article, it's a stupid article, but I really like your camp. Um, so, in 2010, we uh, went to two camps, and this one was actually a large one. Though it doesn't look like there's 40, but there are 40 of them, and then we had another one. Um, this is the one in 2011, we also had two camps, two, uh, 2012, and this was last year. So um, it's, it's really been something that kind of, we had this big burst of publicity at the beginning, and then it's, it's grown a little bit more organically, and it's, it's become a little bit calmer, but um, we do actually have places left for this year, not too many, so if you are interested, uh, do come and talk to us. Um, so meanwhile, the North American camps have been doing pretty well. Uh, they've had a lot of coverage as well, and they're now uh, 16. 16 Camp Quest lo locations across the USA, and that's really something. It shows how much um, a secular point of view has spread in the last 10 years, or even in the last almost 20 years um, in the state. And I think that's pretty encouraging because you, you hear a lot about how America's kind of going the other way, but you don't hear so much maybe about the positive side, the positive things that are coming out of it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the, uh, the Camp Quest history in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're actually going to all this effort and, and what we're aiming for. Um, and so for me, Camp Quest UK has developed from something that was more of an atheist alternative into a community with quite a unique uh, perspective and a very unique philosophy. This isn't really something that was planned out. I, I kind of, when I started it, I sort of thought, well, we'll copy what the US branch are doing. But as we've, we've kind of grown and evolved, year after year, we've reflected on the camps. And, and so we have kind of developed our own philosophy, which is a little bit separate from, from the US one. Um, but we, we still share, I think, the same broad values. So things we value. The main one really is fun. I mean, we're a summer camp, and as, as a summer camp, it's important to provide these fun and uplifting experiences to children. And I think if you're doing any work with young people, you really need to take that into consideration, that you're not running a school. You want them to have a positive experience, and the best way to do this is to get them laughing, get them active, get them smiling. Um, obviously, science, I mean, this really goes without saying, but we believe that the scientific method is one of the best for discovering the world around us. Um, we're very big on critical thinking, and this applies to science, but we also take it a little outside of science. Um, and especially in this age of media having such great influence over our lives, it's, it's very important that uh, for us that the children develop the, the critical thinking tools to examine evidence from all, all around them, not just in, in a scientific way. Um, so reading the newspapers, uh, you know, seeing this new miracle cure or just reading a shampoo bottle and thinking, is this really, you know, got micro crystals or, or whatever in it. Uh, so all of it kind of ties together a little bit. Um, we really value community and respect. Um, and I think um, the secular, atheist, uh, skeptic, free-thinking communities don't often do enough for young people. And we really wanted to create somewhere where the, the children would get to know each other very well and they would go away with a very positive experience. And, and respect is a really key part of that because the nature of what we do, we discuss very personal beliefs, and if you don't have respect, that can go really horribly wrong. Um, and this is one that I think will appeal to QED, nerding out to different subjects. Um, we, we, we don't just focus on science, we, we like all kinds of things. We get a children, children from a variety of backgrounds and they have very different interests. Um, so we're always kind of keen f to hear what they're interested in and, and to share that with them. Uh, so we've had, um, I'm just trying to think what the sessions, we had one girl who was amazing at making, was it origami or paper planes or something like that? And 
and we came, we came up to her in the middle of the week and we said, do you want to run a quick session on origami and just, just for fun? And it, it's really nice because it gives them the opportunity to feel like an expert in something, but also kind of develop leadership skills at the same time. So these are the values that we, we personally hold as an organization. But there are also values that we try to encourage in the campus. So the things that we try to encourage are for them to question your own views, or in other words, be critical. And I think one of the key things we want to impress upon the campus is that it is okay and it's actually fully acceptable to be wrong. And there is no shame in admitting that you're wrong. Um, and you're allowed to change your opinion about something. Um, and this is something that's actually hard for all of us to do. Um, and I think, well, teenagers who are going through the school system have become very focused on achieving results, passing their exams, doing well. There is never the opportunity to fail, to be wrong. It's, there's a lot of pressure. And, and we take that pressure off and we say, well, you might have this idea, and by the end of the week, you might think you're wrong about it, and that's okay. And we'd actually really like that because it means that you have thought about something rather than just sticking to your, to your beliefs. And I think being able to change your mind, being able to be wrong, shows a depth of character um, that I think even many adults don't possess. Um, so the, the next thing that we, we want to encourage is that we want them to know that Camp Quest is a safe space where they can share their ideas honestly. Honestly, not honesty. Yeah. Um, uh, but only if we have the mutual agreement of respect and tolerance for each other's opinions and views. So see above, you question your own views and therefore you should be tolerant of other people's. We want to encourage the campus to really think deeply. Um, I think in the ever frantic nature of modern life, things move very quickly and you're encouraged to give very, you, you're encouraged to give snap opinions, respond quickly, especially on social media, you know, it's, it's type, 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 press send. Um, and, and we want to give them the opportunity to actually to ask them a question and then maybe for them to think for two days, three days and come back to us and think, well, I actually think this. And this is something that we um, facilitate by having a theme for the camp each year. So all the sessions are broadly based on a particular theme and it gives them the chance to explore that topic in, in greater detail. Um, so I'm not going to bore you by talking about comfort zones and learning zones, um, but we do try to encourage everyone to challenge themselves in some way at camp. And obviously we have the physical activities which are challenging in one way. Um, and these activities actually put us in very vulnerable positions. Um, I mean, I'm pretty afraid of heights. I, d I do occasionally go up on the, the high ropes and things. And, and so by doing that as a group, you really share uh, a fear and often share your vulnerabilities. And we found that they're very, very supportive of each other. And um, we obviously try to encourage this. Um, but that's not to say that the only challenge they would face would be physical. Um, for some people, getting up in, in front of a room of 20 people is, is an absolute nightmare for them. And that would be an example of another kind of challenge that they might face. Um, so. We, we do try to encourage them to push themselves, but obviously not in a traumatic way, um, which happened to me at a few summer camps I went to in my youth, so I try and be nice about it. Um, so a question that we actually get asked a lot is, are we a science camp? Um, and the best answer I can give you is uh, not exclusively. Um, I would explain this by saying we're, we're like a science camp in that we do talk about scientific topics, but this isn't our sole focus. Our sole focus isn't just to transfer science from our brains to theirs. Um, it's a little bit more of a wider perspective on things. Um, so we see science as fitting into a broader picture, and that includes uh, developing different types of thinking, and the two types we focus on are philosophical and critical. So I mentioned the P for C sessions, like P for C, philosophy for children, um, which uh, it's actually, t it's taking place in some schools in England, it depends on the county. Um, but we have two, two of our staff members, Diana and Kirill, are trained in P for C, and they lead these sessions. And it's a very, it's quite a strict framework. Um, they take a stimulus, be it a story, a poem, a piece of music, a piece of art, and they, and they obviously are read it or, or they see it. And then they're encouraged to uh, think philosophically about it. So we had the story of Jack and the Beanstalk one year, and 
it's, it's a story that we're all familiar with. Um, but actually, uh, thinking about the story, you can, you can draw different questions. So we have different levels of questions, and they're encouraged to go for the ones that are completely abstract from the text. So a, a level three question would be something like, um, why did Jack sell his cow when it was all his family had? Um, and a level four, the, 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 the reaching philosophical question would be something like, why do people do stupid things when they're desperate, or something like that? Um, so it's something that's quite unrelated to the original text, but inspired by it. And they all come up with these questions, and then they vote on their favorite. And in the following session, they then discuss it. Um, and there are quite strict rules, so you have to have a special thing to be able to talk. And there's, a, there's a, a great deal of rules, but you can actually read about that on the Philosophy for Children website. It's a, it's a, it's a special program that we do. Um, so... The other thing that we do a lot is debate ethical and moral issues. And we actually get the best feedback on the sessions from the campus on, on these ones. Um, because I think this is something that perhaps they're not encouraged to do at school, because sometimes it's, um, they're quite tough questions that we ask of them. Um, so this is, this is becoming more of a key point as we've evolved. We, uh, we, it's something we didn't do as much in the beginning, and I think now we're, we're really trying to work on that, and I think I'm going to say a little bit about that later. So, what do we actually do at camp? <laughs> um, does anyone, can anyone guess what song we're performing here? Anyone? Robots? Yeah. It's uh, from Flight of the Concords, The Humans Are Dead. Um, this was the first year that the staff did a little skit, um, and we actually did it because uh, they had this, this week-long challenge, and we decided that it was all so close, and we weren't going to give anyone, we weren't going to award the winner to anyone because uh, it would be a little unfair. So we awarded it to ourselves. Um, <laughs> but making the robot costumes was definitely fun. Um, so I've, I've told you a lot about what we're trying, what we're trying to achieve. But how do we actually achieve these aims? Uh, what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? And how on earth do you begin to facilitate a rational, critical thinking, scientific framework for children to experience? Um, well, those of you who like Venn diagrams are in for a treat. Um, we do three broad types of activity. So we have the mental challenge. We have the physical challenge. And we have the creative challenge. And this spot in the middle is what we call the sweet spot. Well, we don't, but you know. Um, and this is the one that's usually the most fun. So if we can get a particular session that encompasses all those things, and it is tricky, um, they're usually probably more of the drama, creative, uh, thought-provoking sessions that we do. Um, but these ones are really, really great. But we obviously do a combination of all those three. Um, so for the mental challenge stuff, we run workshops on different scientific topics. Um, or philosophical topics sometimes. We have guest speakers. Uh, we set them puzzles, which are just sort of an on, on an ad hoc basis. So we print out a list of puzzles that we found, we've researched on the internet, and uh, every day we'll just throw one at them for them to think about. Um, sometimes riddles as well, I like them. Uh, we do quizzes, and we have week-long challenges that are based on our year theme. The physical challenge includes, uh, this is all run by the staff at the camp, because I mean, none of us are qualified outdoor experts outdoor experts, um, but this includes raft building, zipline, climbing, archery, abseiling, and mud walks, although we don't do any them anymore. Um, and we've also started doing some morning, morning activities for the early risers, um, which include going on morning runs, for those who are interested, and, and yoga, but that's completely optional. Uh, we do those at seven in the morning, so most of the kids are asleep. Um, and the creative challenge, we do all the fun things that you would expect at a summer camp. So there's music, there's arts and crafts, there's drama, um, and paper mache is really a hit, so we do that a lot. Um, and I was assured that you all like a good Venn diagram, <laughs> so here's one to keep you busy while I just have a bigger sip of water. <laughs> I'm hoping that overlaps a little bit more, actually. <laughs> Tough crowd. Um, so I'm going to focus now, going back to. No, it's not going to go back. 
Yeah. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly now on the mental side of things because I think you can all imagine what music and arts and crafts and the physical stuff looks like. Uh, that's pretty much what you would expect. Um, but if you would like to find more out, out more about them, you know, please talk to either me or my colleague Paul at the end and we can explain what we do. Um, so one of the things we've started doing recently is um, these little mini... <laughs> Sorry, I did that too early now, I just made myself laugh. Um, these little mini discussions, no, I did that way too early, um, in, the, in some of the evenings, um, and we had such a positive response that we've kept doing them. The philosophy for children sessions are a little bit more formal, but these are slightly informal, um, and we wanted to create something that wasn't quite so mentally demanding. So we um, offer different questions. We have three, three groups, and they can pick the question that they want to discuss. They're in different rooms. And then after, after dinner, they go to the room, and they just talk about that question. And we facilitate the conversation to make sure nobody's arguing or talking over each other or things like that. Um, and and this, was, this went down really, really well with them. Um, so some of the examples of questions that we have done is, uh, what does it mean to be sane? Is that the same as being normal? Um, how can we develop the rules of etiquette for the online world? And we had an older camper who led a talk and subsequent discussion about the effects of stress on the immune system. Uh, she, I think she did it because she liked the word, psychoneuroimmunology. Um, and uh, that was really great because she came to the very first camp quest and now she's uh, 16 or 17, I think. Um, and, and so we're kind of gearing her up for, for a leadership role, which is really nice. Um, and there was also a now legendary talk about death in the afterlife, which is something that I think children would probably not discuss as much in school. And maybe people would be afraid to talk about it, but we were it, was, it was a very honest and an open discussion and it went down very well. And this year we, we hope to tackle another difficult topic and talk about consent, both in a sexual and in a medical sense, and I think that will be quite an interesting challenge for us as volunteers. I think, obviously, we would split them into age, different age groups for that one. Um, so that's a little bit about the, the evening discussions that we run. Another feature of the camp is the, the week-long discu- week challenge, um, where we split them into groups of about five or six and guide them through a problem, which takes the whole week and at the end of the week they present their answer to this problem in a sort of dramatic or creative way. Um, so a lot of them do skits, some of them do songs or poems, they'll draw charts, they'll, I don't know, all, any, anything they want they're allowed to and, and it's, it's the culmination of their response to this question that we've asked. Um, so I'm going to talk you through one particular one that we did in 2011. Um, and our, our theme that year was the scientific method, which sounds a little bit dry, and so we wanted to pep it up and make it a bit more exciting. So this is why I have this really cool picture of a giraffe, um, because I really like having it in my talks. <laughs> um, so we split them into groups of five, and six and five or six and gave them a different hypothetical question. So for the example here, um, we gave this group the question, what swims faster, a human or a giraffe? Does anyone know? Can giraffes even swim? I did look this up, and apparently they can. So I was quite pleased, but this was actually the best picture I could find. They, they do swim. It's more of a wading motion, so I suspect they don't, they don't swim very fast. But the children had very, very uh, strong opinions about this, and so we wanted them to, we wanted to guide them through a kind of scientific thought process about how they would go about answering this question, because we didn't, actually didn't care about the result. The, the, the point was to guide them through the process of thinking about it. So the ones who were like, oh, human, human, or giraffe, um, are you sure about that? And, and how would you begin to find that out? Um, and more importantly, what are these questions that we need to ask to, to, to know this for sure? Um, so the important giraffe considerations. Uh, we, we left them alone and, and they came up with some questions in quite a great level of detail. Um, some considered whether it would be fair to race giraffes and human in the same temperature water. Um, because maybe giraffes like cool water and humans like a bit warmer. Um, they, they, they considered whether it should be done in the wild or in a pool. Um, I think eventually they settled on the idea of a big, calm, warm lake in Africa would be the, the most fair test of this. Uh, this is my favourite one. Um, 
they realized that humans understand the concept of a race, but giraffes might not. So then there should be some kind of impetus to get the giraffes going, e.g. crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> um, and even better, it was decided uh, that wearing swimsuits would give the humans an unfair advantage because they would be more streamlined than in their natural state, uh, so they were instructed to be naked. Um, so the, 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 um, the group instructed our team in Africa uh, to make sure that the humans were naked while being tested. So we have naked humans racing giraffes in a lake in Africa being chased by crocodiles. And you'll be pleased to know that we did ask them to do a uh, section on the limitations of their study, um, of which were many. Um, so what we did was, um, I mean, I, I think this, this, this activity was good because it was silly, and you didn't really need any scientific or special knowledge because it was a sort of a nonsense question. Um, and, and so what we did was we got them to design the experiment, and, and we took it away and sent it to our, our volunteers worldwide and uh, reported back to them the next day with the results that were certainly not fabricated using MATLAB. Um, so, so the exercise was really about visualizing the problem, designing a sort of scientific-ish um, ex experiment and, and forming conclusions from the data that we gave them. Um, and we did actually give them some somewhat realistic data. We gave them a few outliers which this group interpreted as the crocodile ate the giraffe, and you know, so they said, we're going to disregard this result because it skews the, the graph, which was fair enough. Um, so it was quite interesting because I think in, in schools, or at least my experience of school science, is that you're given the experiment and then you are basically sort of the lab person who runs it and makes the result, whereas this one, they're the, they're the designer, which is like a new kind of way of, of doing it. Um, so. That was the week-long challenge, and that was for the theme, which was the scientific method that year. And we get a lot of returning campers year after year, so we do change the themes around. Um, and it also gives us a little bit of structure for designing the program. Um, so here are the themes that we have done so far. Our first theme in 2009 was evolution, which coincided with the 150th anniversary of On the Origin of Species by Darwin, and then we have, in 2010, the mind, the scientific method, humanity, which kind of explored what it means to be a human, and, and that was a nice topic because we could do that from a very scientific perspective, you know, the evolution of humanity, but also from a more humanities perspective, um, or sort of anthropological, um, and talking a lot about technology as well, like, you know, are you still human if you have a bionic arm? What if you have a bionic body, you know, where does the, where does the line draw? Um, so, th so that one was quite interesting. Last year we did the future, which also worked as, as well, I think, as humanity did. And this year we're doing one which is a little bit different called Worlds Within Our World. And um, that's kind of nice because that will allow us to look at things on a, on a macro and a, on a micro scale. Um, since we are volunteers and <laughs> the time at the camp, we're sort of working our asses off from 7 a.m. to midnight, pretty much. Um, so we do get tired and, and we have a few guest speakers come in every year to try and uh, ease the load, but also to provide a bit of a fresh perspective on something. Um, and the past guest speakers, hmm, interesting. Uh, let's I've told you about the evening discussions. Here we go. The past guest speakers have included uh, Chris French, obviously, as you can see here. Um, we had Anthony Grayling come the first year. Hayley Stevens has been, Chris French, Simon Singh, uh, Paolo Viscardi, and David Shorthouse. So you can see it's, <laughs> it's almost like a mini QED, uh, lineup-wise. Um, so it's, it's really nice for them to hear from people that, well, they probably haven't heard of them, but their parents are very excited about the fact that they're speaking. Um, so it's, it's nice for them to get this expert opinion and to, and to talk about something that's a little bit different from us because as volunteers, you know, we, we try our hardest, we have our different levels of knowledge in different subjects, but a lot of these people are sort of PhD researchers or you know, professors like Chris French. Um, and so it's really nice to get a, a different view in at the camp and it gives us a nice break as well. Um, I'm just gonna go back. Oh. 
uh, just to say, no, I did cover everything in there. Sorry. Right, so that's um, a little bit of a summary of uh, what we actually do at camp. So hopefully you haven't been completely appalled and disgusted um, <laughs> and uh, are not going to tell us that we're all going to hell. Um, but uh, people often ask us, I want to get, I want to help, I want to get involved. And this is a little bit on, on what we actually need. Um, so... <laughs> there we go. Uh, ways to support us, tell your friends. Um, we rely heavily on word of mouth ever since the sort of media stuff died down and we actually find, found that um, I think people get more out of it if they, if they heard from a friend rather than seeing an advert in a paper somewhere. You know, it's very much more personal and, and a lot of people uh, come back the next year with their cousins or their neighbours or their friends. So it's a really nice way to build a community. Um, even better if you have them, tell your rich friends. Um, if you have children between the ages of 7 and 17, we have two camps this year. We're running a short camp over the May bank holiday weekend uh, in Kent, and that's for 7 to 11-year-olds. And we are running a longer week, a week-long camp in the Malvern Hills in, at the end of July, um, and that is for the 11 to 17-year-olds. So we do split them up by age, although it, we admit 11 to 17 is still quite a wide age, age range. But... Um, it is quite nice in a way because you end up in a situation where the older children are acting as mentors to the younger children and there's a sort of, uh, there's not really a boundary like there is in schools. When I was at school certainly you talked to people in your year group but you never really interacted so much with, with older or younger people so that's quite nice actually. Um, we do pay most of our expenses through the registration fees charged to parents, but um, obviously donating financially will help us because we're, we're quite focused on trying to provide um, subsidised places or even free places to those on low incomes. We do things like payment plans um, because the camps cost... How much are they this year? 375, that's for the longer one, and I think it's 125 for the shorter one. Um, so... You know, that's actually quite cheap compared to summer camps, but for some families that's a lot of money in one go, so we can say, especially if they book early, they can spread it over the months, and, and we really try and support this because uh, sort of scepticism and free thinkers have this reputation for being quite sort of white middle class. I can't believe I put, like, it looks like I'm putting like the token black kid on, doesn't it? Um, but, but actually we do get, m the majority are white middle class kids, and we really want to try and um, and, and get more... Uh, more children from minorities, more children from low-income backgrounds. Um, and also, we, we do get children from overseas as well, which is really nice because um, it gives them an opportunity to practice their English, but also, like, maybe they come from a country which is a little bit more religious. So um, I'm just trying to think who I can give an example of. We have, we've have we had kids who've come from the Netherlands, Turkey, um, Canary Islands, um, so we have, and Norway. So... You know, we, we, we do get kids from Europe, occasionally ones want to come over from America if they're sort of doing a holiday and they want to, to build it into part of their holiday. Um, so we, we really want to try and get a, a mix of children and donating financially is one way which you can help us achieve this. Um, donating your time is another option. We are full up in terms of volunteers for the camps themselves this year. But if you have a particular um, specialty or something like that, do let us know um, and we'll see how you can help us. Um, but for, I think it would be more relevant for the people in this room uh, is writing or blogging about us, uh, since we do rely on word of mouth. Um, d you know, write a blog about how you saw my talk and I was so good and just really, really inspiring. Um, and, you know, like, just give us a little bit of publicity that way. You know, tweet us. Um, I'll give you the Twitter ones a little bit later. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you uh, have a magazine column or something like that, just, uh, you know, let me know. Um, we're all happy to, to do interviews by email or something like that. Um, so that would be really appreciated. Um, so um, thank you very much for listening and learning about us. This is the end of the mud walk. Um, and these are my colleagues, Paul and Diana, who are kind of in charge of the administration now that I no longer live in the country. Um, our website is camp-quest.org.uk. Our Twitter is at campquestuk, and our Facebook is facebook.com forward slash campquestuk. Um, 
So thank you very much for listening. You've been great. And uh, I hope I've left enough time for questions.